The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Let's pray. Father, you who began a good work in all of us will continue that good work and that work that you're doing corporately in our midst and through the church of Jesus Christ worldwide. You who begun that work are continuing that work and you're constantly taking us forward and upward in you as we yield and surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. How to make Jesus Lord is really what uh, what our emphasis needs to be in the days ahead. Do you agree? You know, you can say Jesus is Lord but how to make him Lord and know that he is, is what's going to ultimately separate the wheat from the chaff. Because didn't he say, many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons? Did we not prophesy? And he said, I knew you not. Intimacy with God is going to be the primary, the primary relationship. And what we're, uh, we talked about Sunday was relationship. And I, this is almost a part two to Sunday. In, uh, so I would strongly suggest if you're watching by Ustream that you go back a week or you go back a few days to Sunday and, and listen to that message called Fence Posts. It's a, it's a nice introduction to what we want to take a little bit further tonight. And I'm going to try real hard to go granular and that means little by little so I don't know how far we're going to get but I know that I know that this is a, a significant a significant a message for the hour in which we live in. And I want to start uh, by reading Luke chapter 8. If you have your Bibles with you, if you have your Bibles memorized, then just close your eyes and, and draw from that resource of the word written on the tablet of your heart and memorized in your mind. But Luke chapter 8. Beginning in verse 43, it's the story of a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years. She had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any. She came from behind and touched the border of his garment and immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me for I perceived power going out from me now when the woman saw that she was not hidden she came trembling falling down before him and she declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately and he said daughter uh, be of good cheer uh, for your faith has made you well go in peace I want to uh, start with uh, an important part and that is in verse 45 Jesus said who touched me and of course all of his disciples denied it Uh, you know I didn't do it and Peter and those with him said master the multitudes are thronging you pressing you physically touching you and then you say who touched me it's they were correcting Jesus. I love it when the disciples would correct Jesus because he needed correction every now and then, right, from them. But he said, they said, you say who touched me when in reality the multitudes are thronging about you and they are touching you and then you say who touched. And I believe this is a paradigm shift that's going to take place in the body of Christ in the years ahead that many, many uh, prophetic voices are teaching on the presence of God and, and hosting his presence in many different forms uh, in that relationship. But there's going to have to be something that's going to change. And that change is there is a touching that is clearly interpreted as flesh and emotional. And the church has taught the church inside out and backwards. Oh, you can't live by your emotions. And I agree with that. 
but they have not gotten to the perceptive stage of defining spiritual touch. Who touched me in the spirit? Not physically, not emotionally. Someone touched me and I perceive virtue flow from me. I felt the power of God flow from me. Um, I had a friend that, that basically uh, I always thought that was interesting because he was an intellect, um, IQ 177, and he used to say the same thing over and over again. He said, that portion of scripture bothers me intellectually. In his cerebral conquest of the Bible and biblical literacy, those were the kind that kind of rocked him. And in many respects, he understood the distinction, but in many respects, he said, experientially, I don't understand that. And those of us who said, I understand that better than much of the intellectual, cerebral, doctrinal study. In other words, I had experience and then had to look up what that was that happened. And I find out that touching in that relationship is the nature of God that you touch. And that that touching has to be brought back for us to properly discern. Proper discernment comes from touching the nature. He knew that virtue or power flowed from him when someone touched him with faith. In other words, they touched him in the realm of the spirit and he knew that something was drawing. And in a very small way, all of you have already experienced this in a minor way. When you've shared Christ with someone and felt the anointing flowing and felt that they were taking in what you were saying and vice versa, there's times where you've spoken and felt like the words were falling to the ground because the person listening is gone. They might be smiling, but down in their Bible heart, they, the door was closed like I, I'm not receiving this. All right, and so um, <clears throat> I saw that that what God is going to bring us into is into a realm of understanding the touching realm of the spirit, especially when we've been taught for many decades to ignore emotions because they're meaning. Don't live by your emotions and ignore them because they're only problematic. All right, that's been our soapbox for years to turn that around because we want to see people tapping into the God emotions or the fruit of the spirit. It should be as easy to tap into the fruit of the spirit or the God emotions as it is to prophesy. If it's not, then there's something in your equipment that you failed to develop because you have an anointing and it abides within. And there's a level of instruction that should be coming from within you, not from the outside of you. You have a teacher, a counselor, an advocate, a standby, a strengthener, the Holy Spirit within you who wants to lead and guide you and train you in spiritual truth. And the revelation's been given for you to know this kind of truth. Now, I spent most of the day on this that we have emphasized the voice of God as the word of God, and that is true. We are under the government of voice. That's my terminology. The government of voice. Do you believe is the word of God your ultimate authority? All right, that's foundational. Jesus Christ is more than a doctrine, though he's a person, all right? But his word, he says, in the beginning was the word, the word was made flesh and he dwelt among us. Jesus and his word are one. All right, they're in, they're in harmony. Now, when it says, the part that I want to emphasize is if we do not enter into the spiritual realm of touch, by touch I mean awareness, not your carnal emotions. I'm talking about spiritual know-so in your knower, in your heart, in your Bible heart, in your spirit. So if we're under the government of voice, here's a transition that must take place. It says that my sheep know my voice. 
that knowing of the voice has to be a compound knowing. Knowing implies intimacy, familiarity in a good way. Familiarity, my sheep know intimately my voice. It can't be just the words. It can't be just the words. Just knowing the words is not enough. You must know the nature that's attached to the words. You could probably, we could, if, if you're watching by Ustream, you would probably, it would pay to go back and start over again, lay, hear this again, and then let me move on further. Because in reality, this is a paradigm shift. We've been taught how to think. We've been taught, I'm talking by the church, we've been taught how to speak, even prophesy, for decades now. We've been taught how to act. But up until now, we have not been taught what to do with our emotions. And that's the honest truth. And on the Sunday school board, we put up the little cornucopia of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and everybody looks at it theologically and theoretically, and nobody has any. Jennifer went to a seminar on joy, and nobody had any. But they could really articulate biblical joy from the Bible. And people were actually raising their hand going, I had it one time. One time. That's not a testimony. That's an indictment. You know, that's a, all right. So, you still with me? The government of voice, my sheep know my voice, that knowing must be an ability to touch the nature that's attached to the voice. If God were to give you, this would save so much aggravation, especially in prophetic churches, of knowing that there is something attached to the voice that depicts the nature. In other words, Satan could quote, do you believe Satan could quote scripture? Okay. So, if he can quote scripture, I believe that we have an internal capacity to know the voice of our shepherd. And if Lucifer himself was quoting scripture to me, I have the internal equipment, I have an anointing that abides within, that in my knower I should know that even if the words are scriptural, the nature that's attached to it is not God. If I am a sheep, I know his voice, I know the nature that's attached to his word. And if we don't get the emotional realm submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, if you don't get the emotions under the authority of God, then you have two choices. One, you can stuff it your whole life and, and burn out, crash, burn, and have, oh, by the way, you stuff your emotions, you have a mental breakdown. You don't really have a mental breakdown because of the thought life. You have a mental breakdown because of the emotions. Emo cognition, emo volition. The emotions control the thinking. The emotions control your choices. If, and they're in bundles. They're not, they don't separate. And when it's flesh, they're like three bad little kids. It doesn't matter who's leading the way. They're basically all going to go, yeah, yeah, let's go, let's go do the work of the flesh. Mind, will, and emotion. But if we are going to uh, move in the realm of I perceive virtue flow from him. I know his voice because I can feel the love of heaven. I could tell by discernment that if Jesus gave me a corrective word, I should feel all, uh, see there's that word, I should feel all of the love of heaven attached to that corrective word. Otherwise, I don't receive it. There is such a, there is such an lack of intimate knowing of the word. Most people know more word than they live. If they know more word than they're living, the living part is that they are not intimately acquainted with it. And it requires the emotions to be yielded and totally surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You were bought with a price. You have no right as a Christian to suppress emotions and put on a religious face and pretend what they call that before, hypocrisy, right? All right? So again, I'm saying, if you're watching by Ustream and you came in late, you need to go back to the beginning because this builds uh, uh, sequentially and it's important to get the beginning right. The, the, the truth of the matter is 
that the touching element is the inner knowing or awareness of the presence of God. To practice his presence is to be aware of his presence. To be aware of his presence, you acclimate to his presence, you get comfortable with his presence, and when there is another presence, even on the preaching of the word, you don't accept it. Or a prophetic word. A lot of prophetic words I had anger. Um, Text messages that said nothing bad in the text message, but you could feel yuck on it. You all have that capacity. It's just a question of don't look to experts to do it for you. You, as an individual, have to cultivate that yourself. That's your equipment. This is the priesthood of the believer. You have an anointing. It abides within. No one should have to teach you that. You should be letting the teacher teach you on the inside, good from evil, right from wrong, truth from error. Do you believe that your spirit has that capacity? Okay, then I've given you a capacity to hear and obey. I don't want your sacrifices. I don't want your religious works. I don't want you burned out to show me how much you love me. I don't care about that. What I'm looking for is the satisfaction of an abundant life, and that satisfaction is him. All right? In other words, to do the will of God, you cannot learn to do the will of God through drudgery. It might start out with some duty. You might have to get your fleshly body up and out of bed, but nonetheless, it's basically, it's basically to submit in the morning. Well, we don't like that word submit, but I'll tell you what, we're going to be a lot of people say Jesus is Lord, and he's going to say, I didn't know you because you pretty much were in control of your own life. Oh, you could prophesy, you could do, you could move in the gifts of the Spirit. But here to me is the way it should be. And that is, God, I am submitting today. This is a beginning of a walk in the Spirit. Your will is my will. Your will for me today, your will is my will. You yield to that. You don't try to do it. Your will for me, I surrender, I yield. You don't even hear those words much anymore, but I surrender and I yield. And here's the second part. Your pleasure is my pleasure. Whatever's your pleasure today is my pleasure. My delight is to do your will. There should be in the will of God automatically enmeshed in the nature of God pleasure. You think sometimes we're missing it with duty? And religion, and religion will love to fill in the gap and make you feel never good enough. You didn't read enough, you didn't pray enough, you didn't witness enough, you didn't do something enough. All right? But the will on a daily basis to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in a love relationship is you would simply say, Your will is my will today, your pleasure is my pleasure, and your work is my work your work. There's another one. We have to go slow on that, but we include it in every module, so uh, this is for the visitors. My people better have this memorized. Experientially, Philippians 2.13 is that, for it is God who is at work in me, both, say both, both, to will and to perform, or some translations say to will and to do. Where is the initiation coming there? It's God. God initiated. It's, you know what it's called? Grace. Grace has substance to it. Grace is not theoretical. Grace is the personal presence of Jesus empowering you, enabling you to be and to do. That's powerful. But that's the way he works on the inside. For it is God who is at work both to will and to perform. So our Christian life should be a yielded, surrendered life and then obey out of that grace, that empowerment, which would mean that the nature of God would be prevailing while you did whatever you were doing. And that means taking out the garbage. That means witnessing to somebody. It means all of life. Because it should be a flow. So his will is my will today. 
Actually, it wouldn't even hurt the, I know it's kind of methodical, but it wouldn't hurt to even write that down in your prayer time before you begin, because otherwise you get off on tangents, mental analysis, and usually we usually sabotage with mental analysis. Mental analysis uses 2,000 thought patterns. Entering into prayer and allowing God to search your heart in the non-conscious is the 400 billion. I would rather God went to the 400 billion and told me what was going on than me figuring it out. So, again, let's go back to what I feel is the dilemma. The lordship of Jesus must be the lordship over your mind, your will, and your emotions, and your body, right? If Jesus Christ is going to be Lord, he needs to be Lord over mind, will, and emotions, over your body. He should be Lord of all. It's either all or not at all. And if he's Lord of all, then you have no right as a believer, spirit-filled, gifted, to suppress emotions. You were bought with a price. Your emotions are not yours to suppress As a matter of fact, that's willpower controlling when you suppress emotions, when you stuff it, so to speak. When we were in France, that word didn't translate well, so I'm trying to avoid stuff. But I really like that word, stuff. You stuff it down just like you stuff a pillow. The proper word is suppress, (laughs) okay? You You can only suppress, but here's this. You cannot project or make an emotion. I wish we could at times in my flesh. If I could make an emotion, I would be happy all the time, wouldn't you? I think I'll choose to be happy all the time. As a matter of fact, that's how I got saved. I thought that it was mind over matter. I didn't know the emotions played such a strong role that they controlled the thoughts and they controlled the choices. I saw a real Christian. I mean a real one. And I was unsaved and I wanted what they had because I saw the makarios. I saw the life joy that was enviable, but I didn't want religion. So I'm going, I'm going to, I can do that. I'm not a dummy. I'm going to do mind over matter. And I'm going to be joyful all the time. It lasted, it lasted minutes, and I got tired. <coughs> I couldn't fake it. So why even try? And all of a sudden, I saw that what they had was real. And then I had to humble myself and say, if the real thing is Jesus Christ, then I'm going to invite him into my heart because I tried to do it without it. And it didn't work well. And I tried really hard. It hurt, hurt my face to smile all the time. <laughs> Felt like it was going to crack or break or something. And it took a lot of effort. Well, by the same token, real Christianity shouldn't be a lot of effort. It should be a lot of surrender. And it's almost as if we've done away with that. But in the emotional realm, the most glorious thing that can transpire in your life is to say that even when I feel nothing down here, nothing, it's still a feeling, nothing. No anxiety, no fear, no guilt, no shame, no anger. That nothing is at least momentarily, I'm in harmony with the Lordship of Jesus Christ. At least I'm walking in the light that I have. That doesn't mean I don't need more light, because none of us have arrived. But it means even nothing. Do you know there are people on heavy medication that would give you everything they own to get that nothing in here? They live in a low-grade anxiety as a constant. And I'm talking believers. But God is basically saying, I've given you peace, not like the world gives. The world can give it to you a sedative. <laughs> but I give a peace that's not like the peace. The peace that I give is for your emotional state is a peace that is a supernatural exchange. It literally, when I take 
your pain, your sorrow, your anger, your fear, your grief, when I take it, I replace it with my emotions. And my emotions are love, joy, peace. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. I don't know why we skip this, but if the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy, righteousness is love and action, that means the kingdom of God is the God emotions. And that's why you should know them by their fruit. We've been, we've been analyzing with our intellect all the right answers and missing the forest for the trees. God says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor. He's an emotional God, but they're not carnal emotions. It's agape. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the presence of God himself. All right? Now, Okay, I'm getting farther than I thought I was going to get, but we didn't get to the good stuff yet. One of my spiritual sons from the Bronx, New York, has sent me, over the period of the last year, two scriptures that validate everything we're teaching uh, in, in a, quite a remarkable way. The first one is in the, the Greek word enduo. Every place in your Bible it says put on. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ, put on the armor of light, put on the new man. All of that in the Greek means to sink into as being clothed. When you sink into Christ within, you are clothed with Christ. So this is the epicenter, but you get clothed with him. The other one was in be still and know that I am Lord. Be still uh, and know that I am God. That is... Basically, you can find that in, uh, in uh, see, the first one is the Greek under number 1746 and the Hebrew under 7503. To be still and know that I am God, that actually means to drop down, to sink into, both the Hebrew and the Greek, it means to sink into to sink into, to see God rise up and affect your world. So, as a believer, if you were to presence Christ within, sink into him, he rises up and affects you, and you impact the world around you. That's a paraphrase. Now, good friend from the Bronx, if he's watching tonight, I'm going to use it. He gave it to me this morning. He said, Pastor Dennis, this is Miguel from the Bronx. I came across this in a word study. When you said, this is, by the way, this is Psalm 27, 8, and you've all heard this. And that's where David said, seek my, God, when you said, seek my face, your face I did seek. All right? Simple enough? Well, guess what? Your face, O Lord, I shall seek. The word seek from the H24 H1245 in the, in the uh, lexicon. Seek means its primary power seems to be that of touching, feeling, to search for as being done by touching. To be done by touching, to seek him by touching. To seek him by touching means I'm not using my ear listening for a word. I'm not using my eyes for revelation. I am seeking him almost like a, a, a person in the dark would do. You would, you would feel your way to touch him. So it says, the, and face, by the way, I hope you know this already. When it says seek my face, I hope you're not picture, trying to picture Jesus' face. Face means spirit. And face-to-face -face means spirit-to-spirit, -spirit, all right? So what he's basically saying, or presence in, 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 in the general way. So he's saying, when you, God, said, seek my face, you're basically saying, you, God, said, to search for me as by touching. To search for me as by touching my presence, my face. Search for me as done by touching my presence. And David said, my heart, or my inner knower, my spirit man, my heart, my knower said to you, 
Oh, your presence I will search for by touching and feeling. Isn't that beautiful? We can't skip the feeling realm. Why, why would God even give us a mind, a will, and emotions if emotions were to be discarded or ignored? They were there to be conduits of the fruit of the Spirit, and we were meant to live in the fruit of the Spirit, not in a theoretical way, but in a real way. So whether it's be still, sink into Him, drop down into Him, let God arise, and impact the world around you, or whether it's put on the new man, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, put on the armor of light, put off the old man, put on the new man. The putting on the new man is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's lordship, pure and simple. But in your knower, you must know his nature as well as his voice. We are under the government of voice, but it's the nature behind the voice that depicts whether you knew it. I find that really interesting. We got a chapter in one of our books, Jennifer, that when we met, she was praying with someone, and I had my back to her, and I went, all of a sudden, my knees wanted to buckle, I felt the presence of God, and my, in my head, the thought was, she sounds like me. Now, when I say she sounds like me, it wasn't her choice of words. It was the nature that attached to her words, that there was already, and I turned and I looked and then fell in love and we got married. No, that's the short version, all right? But we're in a time and a season where I believe that God is doing some of suddenlies, some abrupt suddenlies, and in these abrupt suddenlies, there are nature changes that are taking place. And in this nature change, you're going to have to know the legitimate from the counterfeit. Because there's many voices. There's the voice of the, as it says in Isaiah, there's a voice in the temple, there's a voice in the city, and then there's the voice of the Lord. You want the voice of the Lord, okay? Not every voice coming from the temple is God. All right? So, thank you, Miguel. I don't know what I do without the Bronx, New York, every now and then sending me, sending me a word study. But it was so timely this morning because this is what God has been speaking all this time. All right. Seek my face. Oh, your presence, O oh Lord, I shall seek and I shall grope for and search for as done by touching. Spirit to spirit is touching. Practicing his presence is touching. The fruit of the spirit is touching. And yet it shouldn't be mysterious when we see verses of scripture like who touched me for I perceive virtue flow from me. That was very, and the other part is the church emphasizes I only do what I, especially the prophetic camps, come on, be honest, I only do what I see my father doing. I only say what I hear my father saying, but you're missing the point altogether because the seeing and the hearing, if it's not in proper communion through touching, through a presencing, you don't know how reliable it is. The reliability of Jesus only doing what he saw and only saying what he heard was that he was in constant communion. He was aware of the nature of the Spirit of God within him that he was going to be obedient. My delight is to do the will of God. So there was a pleasure in the will of God that was automatic. And that pleasure is always in the will of God. My delight is to do his will. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish the work. I couldn't wait to get here tonight because even what we're sharing tonight, this has got such life on it for me personally that it's got to be a benefit to somebody, right? And I'm telling you, he's taking it deeper. He's saying that we're coming into the time when we're going to know him more intimately and all these courses we've had on hearing the voice of God and intimacy with God, it's got to be more than a course. It's got to be an experience. And that experience must deepen so that we are not led aside by other voices, which gets me to the next part. I don't think we're going to make this tonight, Jennifer. I think I'm not going as fast as I'd like to. But Deuteronomy chapter 13. This is a rather severe chapter. It's the punishment of the apostates. 
chapter 30. <laughs> Wasn't that exciting? Didn't you come? You wanted to come in here about the punishment of the false prophets. But if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams who gives you a sign and a wonder, and that sign and the wonder comes to pass, which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known. Let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet nor that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. Interesting. We live in a world that has other voices. And the purpose that he tolerates those other voices is that we have a beautiful contrast between truth and error, right and wrong, and then we make a choice. And as we choose, we prove our love to him. And he who loves me, I will reveal myself at an even further distinction. All right? So, you shall walk after the Lord your God and reverence and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. Serve him, hold fast to him. Now here it says, that prophet ought to be put to death. All right? In the Old Testament, that prophet was responsible for communicating for God. It was the voice. However, what it says here that really stood out is kind of obvious. He's saying nobody would fall for this if he said, oh, let's go serve someone other than Jesus. That's a little too blatant. So how could people, especially people that were biblically literate, how could they be swayed then? And I'm convinced that it's the nature that's attached to the voice that it's not just the false prophet, it's the voice. Under the government of voice, we're to know his word and his nature. And so it goes on to say here, but that prophet should be put to death. And it goes on to say that. Now in verse 6 it says, it's suddenly shifting from the prophet, the false prophet, to if your brother, the son of your mother, your son, your daughter, the wife, oh boy, we're going to get in trouble here. If your wife, I didn't hear any men say amen, so I'm, we're, we're in good shape. All right. Your wife, your friend who is as your own soul, secretly entices you saying, let's go and serve other gods. That's too blatant. There has to be, it has to be something of the nature that's on the voice because it could fool you by who it's coming through externally. Are you with me? So to really know the nature of God, you're going to have to die to judging. You will never properly discern nature till you make up your mind that I will, I'm going to die to my right to judge by outside observation and appearances. Most people, and if you were raised in a, in a, a, a somewhat dysfunctional home, you learn growing up to observe. Don't, and don't say you were discerning because most of the time you were doing it in the flesh. You were observing and judging actions and attitudes to protect yourself, but that is not discernment. That's a fear-based judgment. Are you with me on that? Can you see that? Accurate, perhaps, as far as children raised with an alcoholic family, they, the first thing that they will say is, what kind of mood is mom in? What kind of mood is dad in? What kind of mood? Because, but that's still fear-based. They're walking on eggshells because of somebody else's dysfunction. Okay? But that is not discernment. You grow up in that. I actually had it in the south side of Chicago. It's called street sense. That wasn't discernment. It was learned behavior based on the predictability of people's flesh. And that, that usually means this, but you know what? In all honesty, you don't know that because it says that man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And so real discernment only knows what's in the heart. And Christians that were raised in dysfunction give in to the opposite of true discerning of spirits. And that is they miss it because they have learned and acquired skills and observation. 
they've learned it even from a survival point of view. I had to pay attention. I had to be vigilant. Unfortunately, when it comes to discernment, you make your biggest mistakes in the kingdom of God. Because discernment to be accurate must come from the place of love. Love precedes peace. Peace precedes your perception or discernment. And quite frankly, all that fear-based analysis of body language, tone, expression on the face, you are in a spirit that is operating opposite of discerning of spirits. It's called suspicion. It's called paranoia. It's called fear-based wrong kingdom. So I don't care how good you are at it. And you know, there are people in the church that actually think that they really have a lot of insight into people and they are really, really dead wrong. But they are really, really convinced that they're right. But they're going by what they hear, what they see, but they're not going by the Spirit. And if anything could be, for me, passed down to a spiritual generation of sons and daughters, I want real discerning of spirits passed down. And love is the foundation. Redemption is the foundation. Discernment is not, oh, sister so-and-so's got a spirit of Jezebel. Oh, sister so-and-so's got a spirit of this. That is not discernment. Discernment has the ability to look for a redemptive purpose. It might be partly discernment. You might be right. But who cares if you don't have a redemptive solution? You're just judging. And you're taking even your discernment. Okay? So, now we've got... uh, Newlyweds, pretty soon? Everybody know? I'm not saying something? All right. And uh, Jason is a newlywed. Here's newlyweds coming shortly. Um, And God already spoke to me that this is going to be a season of divine appointments for friendships and marriages. And Sunday's message was fence posts. Fence post means God's going to make, there's going to be some suddenlies happening in a lot of people's jobs. By the way, Jason uh, uh, Cordell got the job. We prophesied that there was going to be job changes and promotions. He got a good job and he's changed it in what, two weeks? In two weeks. I'm telling you, there's changes, but those changes are good changes because God's positioning where you need to get where you need to be. So in some cases, those changes, don't worry about them because we all, most people, our temperament is change only if God says so and only if I have to because I like (laughs) the status quo, all right? My flesh does anyway. Uh, Used to have a nephew that if my mom even moved the furniture around in the house, he got on he got all rattled because it don't change it. I like it the way it was, all right? Kind of a security blanket. Now, before we get any further, I want to get back into this chapter 13. If your brother, your daughter, your friend secretly entices you to go serve other gods, and you know what they will entice you with? Not, let's go serve the devil. That'd be a little blatant. What they will do is they will operate in a spirit of suspicion, call it discernment, and basically entice you through it because your visual training will see actions and words that'll corroborate it. I remember one time in my first pastorate, there was five ladies all reading the same book. I can't remember what book it was, but it was on, on, uh, on cults. And they're reading the book on cults, and it says one of the chief... Uh, Emphasis that a true cult leader uses is shame. And somewhere in the middle of the sermon, I said, oh, now, if you believe that nonsense, shame on you. All five of them <laughs> turned away. So it's like, almost like you can't use the word, and you can't even joke. That's what paranoia does. That's what suspicion does. You will then say, aha, just as I thought. Trouble is, you usually... It's just you, you and anyone else (laughs) that's in agreement with you that has that better revelation, okay? But look what it says here. It says, if your friend secretly entices you, let's go serve other gods. Here's five things that God showed me. 
that in this portion of scripture, it was not the false prophet, it was not the person, it was the voice, but it wasn't just what was said, it was the nature that was on the words. And it, here's the way it says, now we don't stone people now. This was put it to death. I say put the voice to death. How do you put the voice to death? Here it is. You shall not consent. You shall not yield to that voice. You shall not listen. You shall not pity. You shall not spare. And you shall not hide it or conceal it. If something is on words and it's not clean, you don't tolerate it. There's a wrong nature on it. I don't care how truthful it sounds. Like, so-and-so's really got a problem. Well, perhaps they do. Uh, what is your redemptive plan? Have you been on your face before the Lord interceding in them and letting the love of God flow out and pray and push back the powers of darkness from around their life that there might be a redemptive solution? Or are you just seeing what's wrong? Anybody can be a fault finder. You don't even have to get saved for that. It's not a gift. But the, but the comparison, if you do not know the nature of God, how will you know discernment from suspicion? How will you know, apart from that? If you can't tell the nature, one's got the love nature on it, and one's got fear nature on it. I've watched more people with a fear nature call it wisdom. Oh, you better look out for those people who speak in tongues. Oh, you better look out for the... It sounds like wisdom. It sounds like they're keeping you safe, but in reality, they're teaching you prejudice. They're teaching you to go by an outside observation. You know what you should do if you don't speak in tongues? You see somebody speak in tongues? The humble person, the God person, would inquire of the Lord and say, God, is that you? God, is that you? The wise person will inquire of the Lord, not just judge from outward appearance. No yielding, no listening, no pity, no sparing, and no hiding. Okay, now, oh, I've got time for these newlyweds now. And people who may have a suddenly and all of a sudden relationships come into your life, friendships, marriage partners. Some of you single people don't sit there all smug and think I'm talking to these two. Eh, eh, eh. This could be for anybody. And for married people, don't think you're going to get off the hook here. This is for everybody. Are you ready? There is the building blocks of relationship have four elements. Four elements. One is love. And that's the most enduring. People, people will love you. They'll put up with a lot of your junk. It endures. Love endures. Trust. Eh, trust is a little fragile. Somebody breaks your trust, it's got to be restored. Hmm? But then love will never happen unless you do trust. So even if you take baby steps of trust, you have no other choice in the kingdom because you'll never know the love of God without trusting. You can never get saved without trusting him to come into your life if he is who he says he is. The third one, and this one takes the longest, and that's understanding. A spirit of wisdom and understanding. Understanding takes the longest, but it's a building block of relationship. Remember when the, the Lord told me that as a young pastor, I was over-explaining myself. I still talk too much, but then I was over explaining myself. Now I just give it out there and then it's up to you to figure it out. But in those days, he said, seek. I always was over explaining myself because I was like, I want them to understand what I mean. I know a lot of what I'm talking about is coming from subjective experience. I want them to know in the same way that I know. But then I would over explain. And God says, seek not to be understood, but seek rather to understand people. And it was a beautiful paradigm shift because then what I saw was in understanding people, I began to learn them by the Spirit, not by observation. And I'll tell you what, uh, to this day, that what, need, what needs to get developed. And it is the antithesis of suspicion and paranoia and all that stuff that we call wisdom. <laughs> all right? So here's the two the two concepts, uh, and, and the, oh, I'm sorry, the fourth element is honor. 
And that's the most neglected. So there's love, trust, understanding, and honor. And honor's the most neglected. As a matter of fact, some, the miracles you see are usually happen more prevalently amongst ministering to the unsaved or in another country. Because the church gets Bible hard and they're not as receptive to the miraculous as unsaved people are and people in other countries who are going to honor whoever's giving the message. That's almost a bygone in the church. It's a, one of the weakest things about the American church's honor is we think, you know, they put their pants on the same way we do, but then that also limits their ability to receive spiritually. Not information. They can get the information, but they will fail to receive spiritually. They'll start saying stuff like, wow, this is such wisdom. Where did he learn this? Oh, that's Joseph's kid. He used to play with our kids and instantly minimize and lose the reward of what they could have received. Receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. Honor a man in the name of a, a, a righteous man and receive a righteous man's reward. But when you, once you minimize it and become indifferent, even contemptible, um, you don't receive what they had the potential of giving. All right. So why do I, why do I uh, even want to honor, you know? Uh, why do I want to show respect? The very first thing God taught me in prayer was that when I would drop down and feel his presence, he says, even if you feel like it's the worst prayer time you've ever had in your life, if you would close your eyes and say, I'm here to honor you, he that honors me, him shall I honor. You can't minimize. I really believe much of the revelation God's given me over the years was because of an attitude of honor, not because of great study. It was more knowing him and having the proper attitude to approach him than learning all about him. Did both. All right? So I want to get to the nitty-gritty facts. So I'm going to skip some of this stuff and get to... Out of all relationships, and I'd like to cover all of them, how many are, are aware that there's authority structures? Government, church, family, business, and that God is very clear in his word how to behave in those structures. You agree? Okay. But here's to, this is for you guys, for them, and all you who are going to be surprised with a suddenly. All right. With friendships, marital relationships, church relationships, new jobs, business relationships. All right? There are two relationships out of all of them. Two instances where a dramatic relational shift takes place. Say that back to me. A dramatic relational shift. Just what we want, right? We want dramatic relational shifts. But here's when it happens. It happens when two people get married. In two instances, honor needs to be grounded in marriage. There is a spiritual dynamic that takes place when two people get married. So these, these, these over here probably feel like it's a real point of sermon here. But Two things that happen in, in, in the marriage relationship that changes drastically. You spiritually leave mother and father that you might cleave. Did you know that's the will of God? Leaving and cleaving is not a mental concept, it's a spiritual concept. For this reason a man leaves his mother and father that he might cleave unto his wife. Honor, then, is that you actually honor in a new way your mother and father so that what? Life would go well with you? Mm-hmm. Honor your mother and father that life would go well with you. That's scriptural. However, once you leave mother and father, you don't stop honoring them, but there is a leaving that is spiritual and a cleaving that is spiritual and must take place. That means honor is shifting now to where 
I am entering into this relationship and there is a drastic shift. In this shift, a man leaves his mother to be joined to his wife that they become one flesh. All friendships become subordinate. Your marriage is your primary friendship. I've watched the good, the bad, and the ugly over the years, 38 years in ministry, and I've seen that the best thing for a man and a wife is to be friends. That covenant friendship is the foundation for a really good, because there's things you do as a friend that I see in marriages not happening. Friends defer to the other one. Two buddies, two guys say, I don't like to golf, but my buddy likes to golf. I'll go golf with him. They will defer out of friendship. If that doesn't happen in a marriage, you are better off with just friends. Therefore, you two should act like friends in a covenant of friendship and then go into marriage. And if the guy says, Oh, I'm married now. Listen to me here, Paul uh, and Jason. I'm married now. I need my time with the guys. And they're all waiting. They're all waiting for a hard answer, right? I'm waiting for time with the guys. It never trumps. It does not trump your time with your wife. And if the wife says, I need time with the girls, it's nice to have relationships, but it doesn't trump your husband. It's dishonoring. So honor needs to be applied and there will be a radical shift because don't forget, as long as you're single, this is uh, single people's least favorite term, this is where they'll send me hate mail, but pretty much it's easy to be a self-absorbed single person. Oh, that hurt. Everybody's saying, I know some like that, but not me. I know someone who is. Self-absorbed means pretty much you do what you want to do when you want to do it and how you want to do it. And you'd be surprised no matter how mature you think you are, just have a kid. As a matter of fact, you're not really mature until you have a teenager. You're not even qualified as an adult spiritually or emotionally until you've had a teenager. So there, you've got a ways to go then, don't you? Hmm? Now, Husbands, love your wives. A wife is a gift from God. Show her that she's valuable, precious, and worthy of respect. A wife must not show lack of respect for the authority of her husband or to dishonor him. No wife should talk about her husband and uncover her husband to other people, including their friends. If you do, you dishonor him. The friendship doesn't trump what you have that's special in a covenant relationship between a husband and a wife. One of the shakiest ones you can see is, is, is a woman or a man who badmouths their mate publicly. You don't need discernment there. You can simply say there's obviously serious dishonoring. And wherever there's that kind of <coughs> dishonoring, you need to understand in a marriage, if you wouldn't say it with your spouse present, you shouldn't say it. You agree? Never share anything about your relationship with your husband or your wife that is negative or of a personal nature. If you can't say something good, don't say it. If something would embarrass your spouse or make them feel exposed, don't say it. Don't let someone pull information out of you that actually borders on spiritual adultery. Some people just know how to pull information. I used to kind of get suckered in by one particular lady who was just plain nosy in my first pastorate. And she used to hang around the church and I'd be doing one-on-one -on -one appointments with people. And she would bait me and she was so good at it, I had to learn. It took me a while to learn how not to be baited. But she would see somebody come out of the office. She knew nothing, but she would bait me by going up and saying, oh, pastor, they're still having trouble like they've been. And, and she made that up as if she was in the know. I don't know why some people live like that. It's like, does that make you feel better or superior somehow? 
And uh, do you have a, a suspicious motive and a hunger for gossip, which is poison? Or do you have this redemptive purpose that you just love them so much that you care and you're concerned? You're going to intercede for them and you're going to do whatever you can to help them. Hardly. Some people are very good at identifying a weakness in an individual than exploiting it. Our ministry and what we're teaching is the exact opposite. That when I see weakness in somebody, I'm looking for a redemptive solution that if I'm invited into the situation, I don't impose myself, I want to give them a plan to get out of it. And I respect them more for their honesty by being able to think, that's, what's the difference between gossip and counseling? Counseling's looking for a redemptive solution and for their best interest. I've seen sick, codependent relationships in the church that basically was looking for weaknesses in people to exploit them to get their own needs met. Hmm? And the sad part is, it's a blind spot to codependent people. They'll call it a healthy relationship. This is why I'm saying, to know a healthy relationship from an unhealthy relationship, you must know the nature that's on the relationship. You can't go by observation or by words or by actions. Some of the most manipulative people are very loving, caring in their actions. And as a matter of fact, in some cases, that's the inroad that they use. They keep doing for you so that you owe them and need them. And they find out what you can't do, and they will do it for you, not because they love you, but to, because it, feel, it fills a need in them. All right? Now, in the marriage, in the workplace, Jennifer, do you want to share some workplace examples? Jennifer was mentioning one while I was working on this. She says, this is even before we were married, she saw some, go ahead, you just don't. Okay, this is a situation that happened, um, you know, I was married before he died. He was a doctor, he had his own business, and um, his niece was the office manager there, quite a few years younger than him. And the, my husband and I had been talking about a new car, and I had a particular car that I wanted. And he got to talking with her and she ended up making the decision about the car that I would get. That's like Jezebel in the workplace. I felt so violated, and I was very, very angry about it. That was totally inappropriate, that husbands and wives should make their own decisions, and if somebody gets in there and tries to interfere, they're actually moving in a realm of spiritual adultery. So and we had a, oh, by the way, we had another situation where we were counseling with a couple and the wife um, was upset about a female relationship her husband had at the office. And so he was arguing back and forth, oh, it's innocent and all that. You know, you never get anywhere if you stay in the realm of the intellect. So Dennis said, we'll find out right now if it's clean or it's not. Close your eyes, drop down, think of that person, and a seducing spirit manifested. So the and wife said, was picking up on something. He goes, Oh that was my, wrong. he was humble enough. Yeah. He was a good man. But he said, Oh my goodness, I feel the excitement. So he knew it was dirty. He knew it was unclean. The excitement was not a clean excitement. And by the way, they, they trained pastors, counselors, doctors, dentists. They have all been trained most of them anyway, have had training that if you're looking through your appointment book and you go, it's work. Your appointment book should be work, right? Even as you do it unto the Lord. I've got, uh, I've got Bill Johnson at 9, I've got Tom Smith at 10, at 11, I've got Sally. You felt a little excitement on Sally? That is inappropriate. That is the beginning of a seducing spirit. Why would you get excited over one person. You are looking forward. That arousal is unclean. It's a telltale sign. 
But your spirit has the capacity to do that. Anyway, over the years, what we've learned the most healthy thing for a husband and wife to do is tell the other one if they ever feel attracted to somebody. Like, oh no, this this happened. Let's pr would you pray with me about it? And keeping things out in the open and the and above board. And so Dennis and I'll do things like if we're in the mall and there's a really pretty girl, he might point it out to me. I might point it out to him. But it just really keeps you in the the realm of keeping everything open. Um, We've shared this with young couples, and yeah. some of them are not ready for that kind of open dialogue. All right. But you don't have to wonder. Suppose you don't feel comfortable talking to, a, to someone about it. You can check an agenda. Like um, we use the example of somebody um, just had to live at the beach, had to live at the beach, had to live at the beach. Or if you have to purchase a certain item or um, want to go somewhere or the person, you don't have to wonder if you have an agenda or it's unclean. All you have to do is close your eyes, think of it, and feel what's attached to it. And so that's, actually, that's what idolatry is. The whole uh, book of 1 John is all about the love of God. And the last verse is, little children, keep yourself from idols. So there's a contrast between any idolatry and but the you, love of but God. But you have to remove it from the intellectual realm and bring it to the heart. Because in the intellectual realm, you can justify just about anything. We had two little girls uh, that were basically uh, wanting to make a sexual connection, girl with girl, and was trying to justify the behavior, saying, don't you hug in church? Is there something wrong? This was you, actually a girl who had come in and was kind of gotten part of the youth group and was but, hitting on all the but girls. But was basically a predator. And it wasn't except for the spiritual discernment of feeling unclean or something's wrong here, this hugging is not just hugging. Now all of you have got the equipment. If you don't know the difference between that, then you know, you're going to have to start learning to pay attention because you have an anointing. You have equipment that tells you truth from error, right from wrong, clean and unclean. Anyway, she was arguing with the pastor you know, on a theoretical, what about you know, hugging girls is wrong, girls hugging girls. And so the pastor took it out of the realm of the argument and brought it down to the spirit and said, close your eyes and think about it. And she said, I can feel the unclean spirit on it. It's not clean. Take it to a spiritual realm. Don't stay in the intellectual realm because you won't accomplish anything. Is there anything um, else? I think that was it. I, I'm going to give one more well, illustration. The, the, other, the other one was the woman who came in all mad at her husband, and she openly talked about his work wife. The woman that he was, but the whole thing, it doesn't have to be physical. It's an emo unclean emotional connection. And the easy way to break it, of course, is receive forgiveness, forgive, and present your emotions back, back to God because they belong to him. They're not for you to make emotional connections with people to get your needs met. That's what Jesus is supposed to do, meet your needs. That's right. Okay. So if we totally skip the whole emotional realm in Christianity, we're going to be missing a lot because it's the nature that's attached to the word that is so significant. Okay? I'm just going to give one more just to show you how strong these emotional attachments will evolve to be spiritual attachment. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, witchcraft in the Bible is considered a work of the flesh. So it's a fine line between what flesh starts and what enters into evil as far as spirit. All right? But I once had a young married couple to where the mother, who was a good Christian lady, matter of fact, uh, she was with me from the very beginning, but this Christian mother, her son and daughter got married, were serving the Lord, but the mother was running the ro ruling the roost. She was calling the shots, not the husband. For this reason, a man leaves his mother and father, that he might cleave unto his wife, and mistakes or not, you're your own decision-making entity, and you're going to be accountable to God for that entity. Men, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Women, honor your husband. All right? But in that respect, it was so blatant that it was easy for me to discern the problem, but I waited till they invited me in the scenario, because I don't go around looking for stuff to solve. <laughs> and she came, and she said, 
I just don't understand that. I don't understand that, you know, my husband's having a problem. Uh, he's, he feels like he's being emasculated, that my mother's making all the decisions in the house. And I said, well, that's true. And I says, let's break. You left your mother. She's a good woman, but you left your mother, and it's you and your husband. And so let's break that soul tie. And when we broke the soul tie in my office, in my church office, the minute it was broken and she felt it release, the other person feels that. The phone rang and she called instantly at that moment, at that moment, and said, is my daughter there? And I said, yes, handed her the phone. She says, why did you divorce me? Interesting choice of words, isn't it? Come here. I know what Jennifer's going to say okay, in the book so of Revelation, right? Well, that too, but in this, um, another situation with um, a married woman, school teacher at a school, and she came in and she shared with us that there was a male school teacher that she really, really liked. And she argued some, but she ended up breaking the soul tie. And we warned her, um, Dennis talks about it like a uh, soul tie is like an umbilical cord. The person has an unclean need and that umbilical cord is looking for people to attach to. And so once somebody breaks a soul tie, the other person will become anxious and try to reestablish re the soul tie. So we warned her to be on guard about that and not become emotionally vulnerable. Little 13-year-old girl said, I know how to do all this stuff you're teaching, she said, but I had trouble because I have this one, this one boyfriend. It's a bad relationship. I need to break it, but I feel like I can't. All right? That means that something is stronger than her willpower, obviously. And so when we prayed it through and broke it, I loved her definition. I said, well, do you feel like it was done on the inside? She said, yes. I don't have to hate him. Because it's usually a love-hate. I don't have to hate him, but I don't feel the pull anymore. That is health. That is freedom. Oh, here's the other one that you told me about. It was a pastor, um, an older man who had had um, an emotional connection with somebody, what, 15, 16, 20 years earlier, so a long, long time ago, and thought it was all taken care of, and this person moved to town, and it scared him because the, the pull was just as strong as it had been originally. So you have to take care of this stuff in the spirit. You can't just deal, rely on your own willpower. We're not even going to get to the second one. There are two essential relationships that change dramatically. We even told teenagers that were 13 and 14, boys, the things you've judged your mother for, you're going to reap someday. No. Boys? Yeah. Boys, the things you've judged your mothers for, you're going to someday reap through a wife. It'll click in at as the time of marriage. Married. As soon as that covenant enters in, old stuff that had not been dealt with will manifest at that point in time. And vice versa. And vice versa. Girls, the things you judged your fathers for, you will reap through your husband. Girls, the things you judged your mother for, you will do the same thing. May and I recommend the 60-day challenge for newlyweds? Is that true? Girls? The things you judged your mother for or said you will never do, you find yourself doing it. You who judge, you will do the same thing. Boys, you said, I'll never be like my father, and you end up doing the same thing. It's a law of the spirit that trumps your willpower. So give your will to the lordship of Jesus because you can't change just because of willpower. Now, the second major change, we got to go to the next one. We got 10 minutes. The second major change that transpires in a life, there's changes in all these categories, but the first one is marriage. The second one is ministry. My first pastorate, we had a young man that was a drug and alcohol counselor on the side, and he became my youth pastor, highly gifted, but before that, he was everybody's friend. Good old Joe. He is now pastoring now. Good old Joe. Joe could come in and prophesy the title of my messages before I preached without knowing them. But prior to being a pastor, the people that were in the church had like whiplash when he became a pastor and they only knew him as good old Joe. They had a hard time making that transition. 
because he was good old Joe. Now people coming into the church where Joe was already pastoring had no problem with it. You follow that? Sometimes even when I was a young Christian, I had a mentor who took pride in the fact that he was mentoring me until I started pastoring. He could not reverse it and sit under me. It was like shock. In the ministry, this is different. Jennifer had to learn mm -hmm. this. Jason knows this. He was a preacher's kid. Most preacher's kids know this. But ministry, once you enter into full-time ministry, you're, there is a radical shift between being a pew sitter who makes observations and someone who is where the buck stops and has to deal with situations. And all of a sudden, you see that out there, even amongst the best of the Christians, they are highly opinionated based on observation and what they hear. And what they don't know, one of Jason's former pastors said that, what they don't know, if they don't find out quickly, they will fill it in with imagination, imagination their own opinion. They'll fill in the pieces. And if the church was ever going to prosper, it would be to be tender-hearted, loving, forgiving one another and walking in a forgiveness lifestyle rather than suspicion and calling it discernment. And by the way, while we're on the topic of discernment, if you really were highly gifted in discernment, you would see more loving Holy Spirit than evil. There's more Holy Spirit than there is demons. There's more angels than there are demons, numerically. But you've got an omnipresent God and a personal devil with one-third of the fallen angels. That means two-thirds. But you've got the omnipresent God compared to a personal devil. I'm going to tell you something. If you really have discernment, you're going to know what God is doing, and you're going to know the flow of the Spirit. You're going to know what God is saying, and you're going to go by discernment by the nature of God is going to trump. You're going to be allergic to anything that's evil, but in your allergicness to evil, you're not going to be fearfully afraid you're going to catch it. You're going to want to help pull people out of the muck and mire. You need to be careful and cautious, yeah. But at the same time, you need to be greater as he that's in me than he that's in the world. I need to be a problem solver that is a redemptive-oriented believer. But the two areas where this changes drastically, our staff knows that, right? Once you came on staff, all the pastors on staff know that we have information that other people don't have, but we're responsible to find a redemptive solution to it. Don't ever get caught up in thinking you know better. We call them armchair experts. Because you only have partial information. And in that partial information, you need to be interceding in love, not judging, condemning. There are so many people that would be in church today if there was a redemptive solution and a redemptive people. I know people that are in leadership that are afraid to go for ministry. They're afraid of what other people will think or afraid that they'll be removed. And the higher up they are and the bigger their ministry, the more difficult it is for them to seek help. That shouldn't be so. That's the lack of love in the church. That means we're better at discipline or punishment than we are at love. So when next time you're going to speak the truth to somebody, ask yourself before you speak the truth, where's the redemption in what I'm saying? Or am I just getting something off my chest because they irritate me? Or their behavior irritates? So what are the two of the other? We're not going to cover the other. What are the two most dramatic, life-changing experiences for transition. One is marriage. Two is ministry. Because that's the precious bride of Christ. And you better, if you're on the leadership end of it, you better not lose sight of the fight, lose sight of the fact that that's God's bride. Those are God's people. And you never own them. 
but you're a steward and a manager and you're going to be responsible. But I'll tell you what, I believe we've got a safe place to work through these things. But it's going to be a two-way relationship. A one-way relationship doesn't work. You know what a one-way relationship is? And we've watched this for years. They, they do this innocently, but it's like little children. Someone will come and they'll say, I visited one time, and because I visited one time, you should counsel me. No, 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 we're a family, and it's a two-way relationship. And that means my priority is people who are contributing to the ministry or are contributing to the family in time, talent, or treasure. That is my number one obligation. That's my jurisdiction. Does that make sense? The persons that are contributing time, talent, or treasure are my first responsibility. I could counsel all day long. Do you believe that? Do you know that the need around the world is far greater than anybody's doing anything? We want to teach you, you to we do it. We want to teach the believers how to stand on their own two feet. I don't want to counsel people. I want to teach them how to tap into the equipment that is more than able to deal with anything life throws at you. God made you that way, but we've not, we've not been encouraged towards standing on our own two feet in self-governance. We've been encouraged to be dependent. And if you would learn the spiritual truths that you have an anointing and abide within, you're going to find out that it's almost embarrassing. But there are people that actually say, you know, I've only known stress most of my Christian life. There's something wrong if you've only known stress most of your Christian life. That means you're trying, you're not trusting. So let's pray. If you're watching by Ustream, the two most transitory, new young married couples, you need to deal with the suitcases of your past. Don't sit there and say, she said, he said. Then I'm going to go nowhere. You each brought baggage into the relationship. Deal with your own baggage, you and God. Deal with it, and we teach you how to deal with it, so you're, not, you're without excuse here. We teach you how to deal with the old stuff. But God is going to start planting some of you in strategic places like fence posts. But a fence post is, no matter how well it's planted, no matter if it's in the right location, if it's not properly connected, picture cattle with a bunch of fence posts but no connections. They'll ignore it. They'll walk right through it. To be plant, planted, you must have proper connections. And to have proper connections, it can't be a dysfunctional relationship. It needs to be two-way. What is two-way? Time, talent, and treasure. And you know, they used to call it legalism. <laughs> but you know what? I'm old school. I think the Bible, when it talks about attendance, I think it's talking about family attendance. And when you can rake leaves, as they do in the north, instead of go to church, I say you have a priority dysfunction. Raking leaves is not a life or death situation. That's not... People nowadays find excuses not to... find excuses to forsake the assembling. And it was a problem in the early church, and it's extending to now. It means that Jesus Christ is not Lord. Do you buy that? Lord means he's Lord. In most cases, Christians that would say Jesus is Lord, he's really part of their life. He's not all their life. I'm talking about all your life. That's when things start to fall into place and all things get added, and that includes proper relationships. So, Father, we just pray right now as we cover this series, and I strongly suggest if you're watching by Ustream, if you didn't see Sunday, Sunday's is a precursor to that called Fence Posts, to, to listen to that. Because God's saying, I am bringing supernaturally relationships into your life. I'm bringing change in jobs, functions. I'm bringing quality marriages together for such a time as this. That they, I'm not bringing them together for mutual enjoyment. I'm bringing them together for kingdom purposes. That they would accomplish these purposes. And so, Father, unequally yoked's got to go. That unequal yoke or putting up with or, 
or settling for is nonsense. There needs to be a, a, a radical shift to spiritual priorities and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Seek first the kingdom, all these things will be added unto you, and that includes proper relationships. And for those that have been struggling in relationships, this is a, a time and a season for the redemptive purposes of God to move at an accelerated pace. God's going to show uh, uh, wonders in the heart, not just in the heavens above, but in the heart. He's going to show how he can restore quickly and effectively those things that have gone amiss in relationship. But God's saying relationship, relationship, relationship. The entire kingdom of God is relationship. And so, Father, we who began a good work are going to continue that work in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.